Okay, so let me just uh, kick off for now. I guess there will be more people starting, but it's just going to be an initial intro uh, at this point. So first of all, um, thank you very much uh, for coming here to our webinar. Uh, this webinar will be uh, around uh, workplace relations in the age of AI. This is our typical uh, monthly hour here, uh, sorry, our policy hour uh, as a monthly event here at Holistic. And we'll be discussing about workplace relations in the age of AI, talking about practices, regulations, and the future of equal opportunity laws. Just um, today, I'll maybe for the first time, and maybe hopefully not for the last time, I'm delighted to be joined by a co-moderator, um, not from the team of Holistic, but from the team of AMS. I think just very briefly about myself, as you, some of you may know me, I'm the co-founder of the company. And uh, broadly speaking, we've been, we've been doing this company for over the last three years. And uh, most of the work we do is around governance risk and compliance. And what we try to do is to make any adoption of AI uh, safer, legal, and ethical. And I'm delighted to have uh, Jonathan Kestenbaum from AMS. Jonathan is an MD at AMS, focusing on technology strategy and partnership. He joined AMS in 2021. And prior to AMS, uh, he built and sold a very successful, I should say, HR tech company uh, known as Talent Tech Labs. And nowadays, um, uh, Jonathan uh, works at AMS. Uh, doing strategic advisory, uh, technology and, and strategy and partnership, working a lot with uh, TAs uh, and many people in the organizations around digital transformation for some of the world's most sophisticated global uh, organizations. I hope I was able to introduce you well, Jonathan. So uh, would you like to add something else to the mix? No, thank you, excited to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Nice, I'm, uh, I'm very delighted as well. and. Uh, I hope it's, uh, as I said, uh, the first of many uh, to come. Uh, very briefly about the agenda of the day, um, we'll start first with uh, an initial address uh, from the Commissioner Sonderling, and then we're gonna do a little bit of um, exploration of the impacts. Uh, myself and Jonathan will ask a few uh, questions to uh, the Commissioner. And finally, um, we finish it with, uh, you know, with your questions. Uh, uh, this event. Before I open the floor uh, uh, for the commissioner, I just wanted to like to introduce him. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm more than uh, happy and delighted uh, for, for organizing this event with him. Uh, our speaker of today is uh, Keith Sonderling. He's the commissioner of the United States Equal, Oppor Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, Keith was uh, confirmed by the US Senate with a bipartisan vote uh, to be the commission of the EOC in 2020. Uh, prior to his confirmation, uh, Keith was uh, um, serving as the acting and deputy administrator of the wage and hour division at the US Department of Labor. Uh, since joining the EOC, uh, one of the commission's suddenly highest priorities to ensure that AI and workplace technologies, uh, so many of the HR tech that most of the companies are using nowadays are designed and deployed consistent with longstanding civil rights law. Commissioner Sonderling has published numerous articles uh, on the benefits and potential harms of using AI technology in the workplace. And uh, I would probably say to you today, uh, another article came out, congratulations, <laughs> Akif, <laughs> on this. Um, and just as a final point before joining, the, uh, uh, before being commissioner and also joining the Department of Labor, uh, Keith was a, a practicing lawyer, uh, lawyer on the, on labor and employment law in, in Florida. And also nowadays, he also serves as professional lecturer in the law at George Washington University Law School, teaching employment discrimination. I hope I was able to cover everything. Wow, you didn't need to read all that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's always great to, to hit people's bio. You just learn so much from where they come from. So more than delighted and thank you very much for coming. Um, feel free, uh, all of you. To ask any questions, we might be running some polls uh, during this uh, call as well. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for coming. I'll just now uh, stop my introductions and open the floor uh, to Keith. So, 
Well, thank you so much, both to uh, Adriana and Jonathan, for having me here. I've been able to get uh, to know both of you uh, well in the last few months, and I really appreciate everything you're doing to try to uh, help uh, employers, companies uh, understand uh, using AI in HR in a lawful and ethical way. So I want to start off just an overview about the HR and AI technology market, how it's being used, some of the longstanding laws apply, um, and how the EEOC is looking at it, and then we'll get into uh, the questions and answers. So, you know, today's HR departments have more information about individual workers and about their workforce as a whole than ever before. But information is not the same as knowledge. That information needs to be read and assimilated in order for it to be understood. And that's where AI comes in. It makes dizzying amounts of data legible for businesses culling and correlating information on a massive scale to make workforce related predictions. And that is translating into huge business. In 2021, HR tech spending tripled to 17 billion. And there was a new report out saying by 2028, uh, companies are gonna be spending 35 billion uh, on HR technology uh, with AI. Um, SHRM, the Society for Human Resources uh, Management here uh, in the US, I uh, did a study and they were showing that already one in four organizations that they polled report using automation or artificial intelligence to support all of their uh, HR functions, including recruitment. So this turn to AI HR driven technologies did not happen overnight. The reason I'm talking about AI, the reason uh, the EEOC is looking at AI in employment and other federal government agencies are, are looking at it in their space, is that AI has been involved in the decision-making stage at job lifecycle for employees for years. So whether you're or not, you're aware of it, uh, there's AI out there that writes job descriptions, screens resumes, chats with applicants, conducts job interviews, and then predicts that an employee will accept an offer, and in some cases predicts how the employee will interact with their new coworkers. There's AI software that identifies employees' current skills and potential skills, tracks productivity, assesses employee sentiment, if they're happy, if they're gonna quit, um, does their performance reviews, decides you know, the schedules they should be working, and there's even AI out there that in some instances will tell the employee that they're fired. Now, this is not my forward-looking prediction about the future. For each and every one of these tasks I just mentioned, there's a commercially available product for purchase right now. And the pandemic has obviously increased the speed of developments as employers and employers are finding that dependence on the connections that can be made through artificial intelligence. So you know, back to that SHRM study, they found right now that their members who are using AI, 79% of them were using it in recruitment and hiring. 41% of it were using learning and development, 38% in performance management, 18% in productivity monitoring, 8% in succession planning, and 4% in for promotional um, decisions. However, two in five of the employers um, that source these tools from a vendor say their vendor uh, is very transparent about the steps they take in to ensure that these tools protect bias. Um, there was a FICO study um, I think I'm saying it right, FICO, FICO, uh, uh, here in the United States that showed um, from the C-suite level that 65% of 100 uh, C-suite executives uh, at AI-focused corporations that are using AI felt their companies would not be able to explain how their AI uh, models um, worked. And the same was similar, you know, when Sherm looked at it, that there's that lack of transparency of, of how they're working. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, potential benefits to all this, uh, as I was discussed, and companies see that um, from the efficiency standpoint or from the removing bias standpoint. Now, you know, there's another study that came out in the U.S. from, from Pew, and they asked employees how they feel about AI making decisions for them opposed to humans. And it was pretty surprising. Most of the public, despite, uh, well, maybe it's changed now with everything with chat GPT in the news, but the public remained generally unaware of AI's use in hiring. So the majority of Americans, 61%, have heard nothing about AI being used in the employing, uh, in the, their application process. Um, and a majority of Americans actually opposed AI making the final hiring um, decision, but it's still a mixed bag right now. Um, employer Employees actually, some of them are in favor of it, saying that, um, that it may actually help the decision-making process. It may help remove um, bias 
um, from that hiring um, process as well. So you can see it's all over the place now about how people feel, it, whether they know about it, and then you know if it's going to help them or hurt them. People just aren't there yet. So you just heard there's countless new technologies on the markets to make employers make decisions in employment more efficiently, economically, and effectively. And here's the thing. Many of these promise to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace by mitigating bias. So given the current state of the market, deciding whether to adopt HR technologies is no longer a hard choice. I say you have to, to be competitive at this point. But deciding which to adopt and for what purpose, now that's the hard choice. Carefully designed and properly used, I believe that AI has the potential to advance diversity, inclusion, accessibility in the workplace by mitigating the risk of unlawful discrimination. But at the same time, poorly designed and carelessly implemented, AI can discriminate on a scale and magnitude far greater than any individual HR professional. And this is the challenge for all of us, to define what it means when we say carefully designed, to define what we mean what we say properly implemented in terms that people can actually understand. And then people can actually do the audits to see if the products are doing what they said they're doing. So um, that is really, you know, I, I know part of the discussion, especially where different the laws are, are going, but look, what are we left with now? We're left with human decision-making. And you know, you've all heard about the numerous studies that have shown the ways that employment decisions are vulnerable to the part of bias on hiring professionals. That's the reason my agency exists. For example, really basic studies showing one, that hiring managers are more likely to favor resumes featuring male names over female names, even though the resumes are otherwise identical. Another study showed that African-Americans and Asian-Americans who whiten their resumes by deleting references to their race receive more callbacks than identical applicants that included racial references. And the issue is HR professionals do not become aware of the discriminatory conduct until it is too late. But that's where AI can come in. It can help eliminate bias from the earliest stages of the hiring process. For example, a really Another simple example I like to use because you can understand it, an AI-enabled resume screening program can be taught to disregard variables that have no bearing on job performance, such as an applicant's name. When you think about it, what does an applicant's name tell you about that individual's ability to perform a job? Nothing. But what it does tell you is factors the EEOC says you're not allowed to make a hiring decision on, such as the applicant's sex, national origin, religion, or race. So an AI-enabled program that conducts preliminary screening interviews can be inter engineered to disregard factors such as age, sex, race, disability, or pregnancy. It can even disregard variables that might merely suggest a candidate's membership in a protected class, including foreign or regional accents and speech impairments. And in some cases, replacing an interviewer with a bot eliminates for the opportunity for intentional discrimination at the hiring stage of the, the screening stage of the hiring process. So it's not unheard of. Uh, for an interviewer to meet a highly, highly qualified candidate who walks in the room or is on Zoom. And what do you see? Again, you see a lot of things about that person that you're not allowed to make an employment decision on. Everything from their sex, potentially their religion, if they're pregnant, if they're disabled. And in the hiring manager's head, they may say, well, this person has a disability. That's going to cost me. You know, th this applicant is pregnant. She's going to want to go on leave. Healthcare will cost me, leave will cost me, replacements will cost me. This candidate just isn't worth it. So I'm going to go with someone else with similar skills who won't make these requests. Now, although this is a highly legal, illegal example, it's one of many instances of bias that AI might mitigate at the earliest stages where before those individuals were not able to get past that point. So, um, like, I, but I said too before, if it's carely, carelessly designed, if it's poorly implemented, then it can cause discrimination because like any bad HR decision, poor use of artificial intelligence will damage the trust in the organization that uses it, create a toxic work culture and ultimately damage the profitability all while increasing the risk of litigation. Because AI is only as good as its purposeful and insightful application by informed organizations with an eye on actual impact and compliance with the law. Purposeful application of AI means careful consideration from everything from the quality of data being used to the continuous monitoring of the algorithm after it has been deployed. That's because the predictions that AI makes about specific applicants are only as sound as the training data on which the algorithms rely. So in its simplest terms, an AI that relies solely on the characteristics of a company's current workforce to model the attributes of the ideal job applicant may unintentionally replicate the status quo. 
So let's say if the current workforce is made up of primarily of employees of one race or one gender or one age group, the algorithm may automatically screen out applicants who do not share those characteristics. And the most famous infamous example of this, and it's become so legendary at this point, who even knows if it's true. Um, the legend goes, employing this metric, at a resume screening company found the most likely predictors of success at one particular firm after running the machine learning and looking at their um, the employees that the uh, employer said they want to replicate. Um, the most likely indicators of success at that firm were being named Jared and having played high school um, lacrosse. Um, so that is certainly um, not a way to diversify your workforce. So for me as an attorney, I, I've dedicated my career to labor and employment law, and I want to see AI reach its full potential in the workplace. And as an EEOC commissioner, I'm committed to helping workers and employers and vendors understand their rights and obligations when it comes to technology. So the EEOC's mission, um, from those of you watching from outside the U.S. today, is to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and advance equal opportunity for all in the workplace. Many of the laws we enforce predate by over half a century the AI technologies we're discussing. Nevertheless, federal anti-discrimination law is as applicable to employers who use AI to make employment decisions as they are to employers who rely exclusively on HR professionals. The EEOC enforces Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, the Equal Pay Act, the AIDS Discrimination and Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. These laws protect not only employees, but job applicants from discrimination based upon race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, pregnancy, national origin, age, disability, and genetic information. And to what I was talking about before with all the different types of uses of AI, that's our, what our laws apply to, more than just hiring, firing, promotions, training, wages, benefits. Our laws also prevent harassment and retaliation. So it, it really applies to every employment decision that employers are now using AI to make. And under our laws here in the United States, employers are generally liable for discrimination, whether or not they intended to discriminate. Because that's because our laws are so powerful because they're civil rights laws. And this is absolutely a crucial thing to bear in mind as companies start going all in on HR technologies. In HR, data is everything. Data makes a difference between a good hire and a bad hire, a good promotion and a bad promotion. And what I'm trying to raise awareness of, it's the difference between lawful and unlawful employment decisions. Because outside the realm of science fiction, AI has no motives or intentions of its own. AI only has algorithms that enable it to correlate data and make predictions. And according to industry experts, this is one of the things that makes AI so attractive to employers. Its reliance on hard data creates the potential to eliminate discrimination by removing human bias from the decision-making. And when it is designed in a clear and explainable way, it eliminates one of the biggest challenges to HR, the human, human taste. And when employment decisions are made with bias, whether intentional or unintentional, these are decisions are very, very hard to prove because the human mind is difficult to understand. And outside you know, communication, we can never know what a person's true motives are. And if you think about what we're left with now in our investigations or lawsuits, if the discrimination happens, how do we find out the discrimination? Through depositions, through court cases, through asking people. And if somebody has intentionally discriminated, as we know, it's very unlikely for them to admit, yes, I have bias in hiring and I won't hire this, this group. It just doesn't happen that way. But AI can help correct for that black box problem. Carefully designed, it can mask for race, gender, age, disability, or other characteristics. It can mask for proxy terms, like the example I told you earlier, people's names, the names of sports teams or someone's graduation date, or the schools they went to that may indicate a protected class. It can help employers take a skills-based approach to hiring. It can help offset the well-documented confidence gap that leads women to underreport their abilities on their resumes and men to overstate theirs. It can identify candidates adjacent skills, and it can identify candidates for those life-changing, upskilling and reskilling opportunities, which is very popular uh, in HR now, especially since a lot of these jobs um, may be automated by chat GPT or other types of AI. So in short, AI can identify the best candidates based not only on their merit, but on their potential, all while stripping out human bias. But at the same time, AI can replicate and amplify existing bias when it isn't properly designed. And then so my fear in all is, is, is that the objective, the objective nature of algorithm decision-making can result in technological bias on the part of the user. 
That is in over-reliance, if not blind trust, that the AI is always going to get it right. In this case, users may lose sight of the fact that AI is self-reinforcing and requires close monitoring. So employers can't adopt a set it and forget it approach to HR technologies because inaccurate, incomplete, or unrepresentative data will only amplify rather than minimize bias in decision-making. And that is where you know, this conversation comes in and we'll talk about some of the new laws potentially requiring this to happen, but you know, employers, nothing preventing them like they do with other employment practices for decades to, to test, to test the algorithms, to make sure that the algorithms get it right, evaluate its performance. And if it proves unworkable, abandon the program without ever using it to make a hiring decision that's going to violate the law, that's going to not move forward the reason these products were purchased to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, or some of these other issues. Um, but again, it, it's more than just hiring. Um, it, it's AI is being used in the HR space to make recruiting more inclusive. Some programs use natural language processing to help employers write job descriptions that promote greater diversity in their applicant pools. The way a job description is written, the specific words used and the way requirements are described can have a significant inf influence who applies. So there's AI that goes through these linguistic patterns and the job descriptions with historical applicant behavior and correlating hiring outcomes to predict which word combinations are most likely to attract applicants. Um, it, and provides real-time feedback to employers on how likely their word choice risks alienated applicants of one gender or another, enabling the employer to aim for maximum inc inclusivity. And you think about in the tech world, you know, it's become commonplace to say, hey, I'm looking for a ninja coder or I'm looking for a rock star, you know, but that may be indicative of a man. So um, it also is helping employers reduce talent acquisition to a science, helping employers identify and target highly qualified candidates who may not even be looking for a job. In these cases, uh, marketing firms, and headhunters uh, are replaced by algorithms that scrap publicly available browsing histories, resume da uh, databases, social media, news publications, professional websites, which are, are very popular now for especially uh, coders and engineers to showcase their work. And you know, this isn't that much different what commercial advertising does, looking you know, for individuals who to target the advertisements to, but uh, which is called micro-targeting and which is how um, online uh, media companies and social media make a lot of money. But it's one thing when you are doing that for a commercial product. It's different when you're doing it for employment advertisement opportunities, because if an algorithm training data skews heavily towards people of one sex, religion, national origin, race, you name it, these protected characteristics may come to play an improper role in the algorithm's predictions about the members of its target audience. And the AI may say, well, this is where, um, you know, this is who we should be showing because this is the historical behavior that recruiters have been using, potentially uh, injecting bias into those clicks. And it may then downgrade proxies for race or gender, such as the name of historically black colleges or the names of women's sports teams. Again, not because the computer is intentionally targeting and discriminating against these individuals. It's because they weren't represented in the training data. So it doesn't stop with the resume screening programs. AI is now being used to conduct job interviews. And here uh, through an app or online, it presents a series of questions that applicant answers on videos. Then natural language processing comes into play, evaluating the substance of the candidate's interview. And this may be a really good thing. A reliance on word alone may actually allow employers to take that hiring approach of saying, we're going to hire the person who answers the question the best outside of you know, what they look like and just the way we want these answers, these questions answered. And that may, reliance on voice may then reduce the discrimination based on someone's outward appearance. But without significant safeguard, voice recognition may be unable to account for foreign accents or speech impairments, giving rise to the potential for disparate impact based upon national origin disability. And the tension is between whether hiring technologies actually deliver on their promises or whether they effectively discriminate is also evident in the case of employment assessments that have now gone online. So assessments became very commonplace in the years following World War II as the field of organizational and industrial psychology grew and as the post-war period ushered in an economic boom. So multiple choice assessments that were once completed with number two pencils on Scantrons now look more like video games than they did do the SAT. And this is really providing workers, uh, companies in high yield, high turnover industries 
um, a way to get employees in the door and have the potential to mi minimize bias by shifting the employer's focus from a resume to aptitudes and attributes, um, which is obviously what uh, talent acquisition, that skills-based approach has been looking to do for a long time. But at the same time, they're as vulnerable as to disparate impact claims as the Scantron sheets is old. So employers must use them with equal diligence because our, our laws here uh, were really based on disproportionate adverse effect um, uh, related to disparate impact that a company's standardized test had on African-American employees in the 1960s. So it, it, it's the same challenges here if they're being used. And they can present novel challenges to people with disabilities as well because of the generalized electronic interface that they employ. So all this presents the challenge of finding the right division of labor between algorithms and HR personnel, between using AI to improve human decision-making and delegating decisions entirely to algorithms because using AI to make decisions ordinarily made by HR professionals can have significant legal ramification. So th this is where, for, from our perspective, employers really need to exercise caution when deciding when and whether to hand handle such matters over to algorithms. Because an algorithm, no matter how sophisticated, may not be capable of the sort of sensitivity and responsiveness needed to meet the needs of employees who need accommodations. This means that humans must remain in the decision loop for some uses of AI HR uh, technology. And for vendors and users of AI systems, the closest thing to guidance on how to test for discrimination uh, using these uh, models is the EEOC's 1978 Uniform Guidelines on Employment Employee Selection Procedures. And to that end, um, especially uh, you know, for people who have done employee testing for a long time know that that's a technique through which to test for disparate impact known as the four fifths rule, but it's not universally applicable formula that proves whether or not a selection practice is discriminatory in all cases. It's one of many that help um, employers find evidence of disparate impact. Um, so there's no absolute and unfailing formula to prove disparate impact discrimination. And, and this is you know, where, where we need everyone's help it is to continue to find and use creative ways to make sure that these programs are not discriminating based upon longstanding existing law and the numerous tests for discrimination that are out there. And that's um, really what I've been trying to emphasize is that as employers, um, through in-house, through your consultants, through your lawyers, through your accountants, through your psych uh, IOs, you know how to test. And you don't need to let some of these algorithms fool you that you don't know how to do to see if there's employment discriminations, because ultimately the results um, will show there as well. And also for employers who are looking you know, to buy these systems, it's asking the vendors the questions about how they did their testing, because a lot of you know, vendors have spent a lot of money testing and showing you um, the data sets, but you can ask what type of statistical analysis did they perform? How did they choose those methods? Why is it the right fit in this case? What were the results? Do they retest? So, um, you know, that has been around for a good amount of time. But as, as you all know, governments worldwide are really paying attention to the use of AI in all areas, including here at the EEOC. We have a uh, initiative that was announced in October of 2021 that we are looking closely uh, at this issue. Uh, we put out guidance related to how AI works with the, under the Americans with Disability Act for job applicants um, who uh, have a disability and how they can be able to use these systems and how employers still need to give them reasonable accommodations um, and how the AI can't screen out individuals with disability or can't seek uh, unrelated medical inquiries um, as well. And we put out additional guidance today um, regarding you know, that disparate impact I just talked about and how these longstanding principles continue to apply equally um, to testing when it comes under Title VII to see if these programs are having a discriminatory result. So uh, in conclusion, all this is to say is that employers should do their due diligence when it comes to vetting AI. Workplace discrimination imposes heavy human, social, and financial costs. So um, I, I want to conclude with some key takeaways before we have a discussion and question and answers is that, as you heard, our laws may be old, but they're not outdated. They apply with equal strength to employment decisions that AI is making in 2023 and beyond, as they did to decisions made by HR personnel in the 1960s. And second, whatever the algorithm is, whatever the decisions, 
employers have to watch for both discriminatory uses that's intentionally using these programs to discriminate, which, you know, a bad actor potentially could at scale or discriminatory outcomes where we're seeing a lot of the discussion around the potential issues with using AI with these neutral policies that have those discriminatory results. But guess what? Liability is going to be the same either way. So deciding to entrust algorithms of people's livelihood is a complex and important matter. And we all cannot realize the potential of AI unless it is developed and utilized in a manner consistent with our laws and values. So while AI is becoming mainstream technology in the workplace, discrimination by algorithm uh, must not. So um, I hope that was a, a good broad overview of, of AI in the workplace, uh, how the EEOC and the law looks at it. And uh, I look forward to our discussion. Thanks, Keith. Much, much appreciated. I think it was a, an excellent address, I would say. And there was a been, there, there's already kudos for, for you on the Q&A for your, for your excellent address. I, I just want to start, and uh, then I'll open the floor to Jonathan. Um, and I, I can imagine the amount of issues you probably have to deal with being a commissioner of the EOC. You know, I can, maybe we can go through the list, but on having to deal with uh, employment discrimination around disability, uh, sexual harassment, you name it. Employment. Yeah, we're the agency that deals with the Me Too movement, pay equity, yeah. diversity, equity, inclusion <laughs> programs, age discrimination, you know, um, <laughs> uh, you name it. Uh, uh, yeah, that, cool. That's what we do here, really the core claims that affect yeah. HR professionals on a daily basis. Yeah, the agenda is full. And then and now uh, uh, it's been, I think I would say to you the last six months, have been equivalent to the last six years around uh, this development and that AI being on top of the agenda. How do you how do you finding time and like and not only finding time of, and bandwidth for it, but um, what also drive your interest as well into the topic? Well, personally, what drove my interest is because this is the future. And when I started talking about it, there was such a distraction about what exactly we were referring to. And um, for a lot of companies, they were essentially brushing it off because they thought it was related to automating workers. And um, you know, there's a lot of statistics out there. The World Economic Forum has a pretty good one that 85 million jobs might be displaced or the other ones related to, uh, the Brookings Institute has another one that if, if you wanna be scared on this topic, um, that you know, they, they analyzed the Department of Labor's job database um, there's 769 categories of jobs in the labor database, and they found that 740 of them have some near near term, uh, near -term risk of automation. Or you've seen, you know, what IBM said about 8,000 jobs that could be done through uh, ChatGPT and generative AI now. So when I first got into it, before even ChatGPT discussion, a lot of it thought it was just about automating workers, and it wasn't applicable to them yet as employers because they weren't in manufacturing, they weren't in um, logistics or these some of these areas that have been already, um, we've seen automation. Uh, and it, and it, it was to the core HR and actually using AI to make decisions that were uh, about your current workforce or your future workforce. And there was just a lack of awareness, you know, how widespread these tools already are. And the, and the potential to build those safeguards and guidelines around them, but that the longstanding civil rights laws applied equally to them. So I found that was a big um, issue related to you know, lawyers, see, uh, chief executive officers, chief human resources officers, talent acquisition. You know, they want to use this, they want to deploy this. They just had a lot of questions regarding the legality of some of this uses. So that's why I thought it, it was worthy to take on. And then obviously um, the EEOC has made it a formal initiative. It's also in our strategic enforcement plan drafts that were released. So for the next you know, five years, every five years, the agency puts out what our priorities are and AI you know, is uh, almost at the top of the list. So that means that we're gonna continue to do guidance. We'll do enforcement. It's just a priority of the agency. And I think that's um, extremely important. So I just want to say <clears throat> thank you. I really enjoyed the, the talk you gave. It's really fun for me. I'm a licensed attorney still, so I get to see both my worlds colliding here. And actually, everyone here on the call is here to witness the name of my next kid, Jared. So uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I wanted to dive deeper into. No uh, on that. <laughs> I wanted to dive deeper into um, generative AI. Um, what impacts do you think this is going to have on talent technology, um, you know, going forward? 
Yeah. So, you know, the core AI HR systems are a little different, it, you know, using machine learning to make the predictions about compensation, about work schedules, about performance reviews, about hiring, you know, that's sort that's been out there for um, a while. And Jonathan, I knew you were involved in this uh, at, the, at its infancy. So you've seen it develop. And now with the chat GPT being layered on there. So there's two parts of the chat GPT, one on the workforce side of it, which we don't really you know, handle here at the EEOC related to workforce development and training workers. We, we care who gets those uh, opportunities and that any layoffs related to chat GPT or generative AI or people whose jobs are going to be replaced, but get those upskilling or reskilling opportunities, that those decisions are not based upon um, somebody's race, sex, national origin, or age really can be, you know, a lot of claims we may see out of this. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, it's just, you know, who gets selected for new opportunities or who gets laid off can't be based on these, those protected characteristics I listed. But the other issue is how can chat GPT inject bias into HR? And, you know, you read the same articles I do about, you know, HR now using it to create job descriptions, to do performance, using chat GPT to do some of the other, the functions um, that HR professionals normally do. So if you're using chat GPT to create a job description, you really don't know what characteristics it's putting in there uh, that it may find on the internet. It, it, it may get you, you know, chat GPT make me the most perfect job description for, let's say an electrical engineer, right? And it comes back and has all these factors that have nothing to do with your location, with your workforce, with your business. You're injecting all these factors in there that you would not be able to show that there's a business necessity for, or it's related to the job, which is what the EEOC will require you to do. And it says it puts qualifications in that that might uh, prevent certain people of certain protected characteristics from getting the job when they're certainly able to do the job for your company. So that's where you could see ChatGPT injecting the bias in there too. And also, you know, for performance reviews, you know, ChatGPT, create me a performance review of somebody who I want to terminate, you know, in six months, right? So, uh, and you don't know what kind of biases it may uh, inject in there that has nothing related to do with their job performance. So, um, you know, the, the, using generative AI to do some of these um, functions, uh, just, just be careful of what actually requirements um, or characteristics it's putting in. And what, one question, Keith, regarding now uh, uh, regulation, uh, which I think is also always at the top of the agenda. And I think, I mean, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, there was already a session in Congress regarding just, let's say there was more like a general uh, uh, regulation around AI. Uh, but if we focus ourselves on the on the, on our topic here, could you give us a kind of a state of uh, regulations uh, on the kind of HR landscape regarding not say AI, but I would probably say tools that people are using in HR tech. Uh, in yeah. General? So so there's you know from my position in the executive branch, we we enforce the laws that Congress creates, and whether or not Congress is going to create new laws um, related to AI. Uh, or AI specific use, sort of like you're seeing in New York or you're seeing in the EU, you know, that's a different story. So from my perspective, all we can do is continue to enforce the laws that are in the books, the laws that HR professionals know, the laws that our investigators know, and that labor and employment lawyers um, know as well. And that's part of the guidance the EEOC put out today is that, you know, for testing for disparate impact, you know, there's, there's longstanding tools and there's longstanding laws. And that doesn't change because the decision is being made by the technology, it does not matter. What we look at, um, what courts look at are the results and how you got there, whether it was made through a computer or made through a person doesn't matter to us. And it's use those existing frameworks. But look, that you can't ignore what's going on in, in Capitol Hill or, or even you know the White House, the Biden administration, Office of Science and Technology Policy has put out a, you know their bill of rights um, about, you know, transparency, you know, accountability, you know, lawful use of it, you know, sort of these, these, these principles that I, I think everyone, you know, agrees with in a sense, but we are seeing different agencies just doing what they know best, enforcing the laws, um, how it relates to AI. So whether it's the FTC on the advertising side, HUD on use in uh, housing decisions, um, or other, you know, using credit, different areas, 
FDA used in medical devices. So everyone's sort of just staying in, in their lane, enforcing you know, the laws. The EEOC put out a joint statement with the FTC, with the CFPB, making sure I'm getting th those right. A lot of a word salads uh, jumbles in DC with the names of these agencies and the Department of Justice, uh, mm -hmm. Civil Rights, that you know we're all looking at this and we're all using our existing tools because that's all we can do. And if Congress decides to make an AI framework, you know, there's been proposals, the Algorithmic Accountability Act, which would have given more jurisdiction to the FTC to look at this. Um, but none of those have passed. So I think for now, um, for employers, for companies using this technology, at least you know the framework that applies to this is just no different than what you've been doing for all your employment decisions. Do you have any advice for talent leaders on how they could take a more proactive stance, like things they should be doing? Yeah, and this is sort of where now, you know, New York comes in uh, or what the EU is proposing, um, it designated certain uses of AI, like in employment. Um, you know, the EU is saying that's in the, one of the higher risk categories by taking a risk-based approach. And what comes with that? It comes with disclosure. It comes with, you know, potentially pre-deployment audits. And the same in New York City with their um, local law. Um, related to the use of AI in HR to make hiring or promotional decisions um, in New York. And that's going to require, you know, these pre-deployment audits done by an independent um, auditor. Um, but, you know, for them, they're just requiring it on certain categories. For the EEOC, we look at everything. So, you know, if New York's looking at just the hiring and promotion side, you know, we're still looking at its use in benefits, in training, in termination, and not just for race, sex, or race, or uh, ethnicity or is, uh, sex, we're going to look at all the protected char characteristics, you know, disability, age, you know, religion, whatever, you know, the protected category is. So if you're now being forced to do audits by some jurisdictions, and I know California has some proposals as well, you know, it just, it's just more reason why employers can be doing this themselves. And employers don't need a new, you know, a city or uh, a European continent to tell them, um, to do this when you can be doing those right now. And the more you do in advance, and the more you, you know, you like the examples I gave you earlier in my opening about testing the system, you know, seeing as before and seeing if it's being used for its intended purpose before it actually makes an employment decision, that's a good thing because that's preventing discrimination from happening. It's making sure the tools are being used. So there's nothing preventing employers to work with the vendors to create a structure where they're going to test the program, be properly trained on the program, in accordance with our long-standing laws to see if it works or, or if it doesn't before it actually affects someone's livelihood. So, so I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correct. So what you're saying is there, there are, you know, there might be some new state laws coming out, but there actually are existing federal laws that these technologies apply to today. And right. we, we need to pay attention to um, the, those laws um, equally. And so these new state laws might bring in new things that we have to do, be it an audit or a disclosure. Um, but actually, some of these technologies might be violating existing federal laws. Correct. Uh, or they may be helping companies comply with existing federal laws. It, it's sort of, you know, like everything I say, you know, the, the pros and cons of this for each use of it, it can help the EEOC's mission to prevent employment discrimination, to advance equal employment opportunity in the workplace. But, but at the same time, if it's not designed properly, it's not implemented properly, it can then um, discriminate. And, and we know that based upon our standards that have been around for a while. And I think there's just this interesting dynamic now with this push for more diverse workforces. Um, you know, companies are increasingly looking to technology to help them, you know, find, you know, diverse candidates. And uh, the challenge is they can't really rely on those classified characteristics in the hiring process, which makes it a challenge. Correct. And uh, that's, you know, Jonathan, as we, as we discussed before, um, you know, those decisions, you, just like you can't fire somebody, let's say, because they're a woman, you can't hire somebody because they're a woman, you know, absent very, very rare circumstances. But, um, using these tools to make those decisions, um, you, you just can't do, but can you use them to make your applicant pool more diversified? Absolutely. Can like the job description and program, you know, if that helps get more women to apply who typically wouldn't, and there's a lot of studies out there that says women are less likely to 
apply to more aggressive job descriptions who are more qualified than men who are more likely to apply who are least qualified if that can help us you know bridge that gap there you know and get more diverse workers in the applicant pool that's a great thing and that's something you know as talent acquisition professionals have been trying to do a, a long time by recruiting in, in places they don't normally recruit I'm using different job boards and AI can really scale that pretty significantly to get them in the pool. But the ultimate decision, again, is going to be based on their skills, their ability to perform the job if they're the most qualified person. And that's where AI can also come in now and strip all those biases of saying, well, it doesn't matter if this person's the most qualified person. It's a female. I don't want to hire a female for this role. I'm putting the resume in the trash versus using machine learning to say, here's the skills, here's the patterns. This is your best candidate. And you don't know anything about them can really help bridge um, that gap as well. So um, to, to answer your question in short, no, you can't use it to potentially only hire a diverse candidate, but you could certainly use it to get more diverse candidates in the applicant pool, which by the way, is, has been the goal. And you've been in talent acquisition for a while. That's the, the, the goals of talent acquisition for a long time now. No, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to pick one question from the Q&A now uh, for you, Keith, which I think links to the announcement because I, I, I was fa uh, thankful in the team have raised send me uh, the announcement you guys did today. Um, so I did a really quick scan. And it was quite nice because a part of the announcement, they were mentioning that the four fifths rule, for example, is a rule of thumb. Which was Correct. a, which is a discussion and uh, and the one thing that was put on the Q and A is regarding sort of revisiting um, the uh, uniform guidelines uh, in many ways, like maybe increasing the number of metrics, increasing the number of like uh, intervals of acceptability. Et is that something on the roadmap uh, for that? If that's a question, uh, that's uh, it's a million dollar question. People have been yeah. asking that for a long time. Uh, will the fourth, fifth rule be updated? Look, it would take um, numerous agencies to do that. And, you know, the bottom line, there's been decades of uh, industrial and organizational psychologists who've been trained on this. There's um, specialized forensic accountants who also have trained on this and lawyers. So um, nobody has really proposed anything newer or different or better in, in the meantime. So uh, I can't, can't predict, nor do I have the power to um, amend those rules right now. Um, I, I would just say, you know, like the guidance says, it, it is a rule of thumb, but it's better than nothing. It's better than, you know, completely just um, not doing an analysis and, and not seeing if there's any potential discrimination. Yeah, I'll probably say that this has become a kind of a global standard in many ways, <laughs> yeah, because it's really filling a gap. Uh, it's basically everywhere, not only in, in the US, but globally, I should, I should mention. Absolutely. Um, there are a few other questions, maybe Jonathan, if you want to go for yeah, it. Uh, there's some interesting questions, a lot of questions. So I'm trying to sort through them to find the, the most interesting ones. This one's, I guess, provocative in nature. Uh, so I, I feel like it's a good question to ask. Um, how many companies has the EEOC fined in 22, 23 for misuse of AI in recruitment discrimination? And the question is really around, is the risk really a risk despite the law being the law? Um, you know, most candidates will never know that they were discriminated against. So you know, people raise a complaint to the EEOC and how likely is it to kind of get further down the path and result in action? So um, it is a provocative question and one I can get out of easily answering is that we don't uh, we, uh, disclose that. Um, you know, we only disclose the, the when we file litigations or, or the results of those litigations. So a lot of that has uh, confidentiality. But what, what I can say and what I've talked about is the certainly the lack of awareness of, the employees being subject to this technology. And I think why you haven't seen more public cases against uh, employers who are using these tools because the employers are the ones ultimately liable, you know, the cases are against the employers, not, not the vendors, is that the lack of awareness that a decision, I was not hired or I was not promoted or I was fired because of an algorithm and not just a person. And, you know, if an employer employee gets fired, they say, well, they just must didn't like me versus a, a discriminatory algorithm. You really have that lack of knowledge. And I think, you know, with New York, with the disclosure requirements that's being used, you may see an uptick of cases after that because now they're being subject to these tools. And, you know, these tools, which, you know, may or may not have bias, and that just may be a way. But it doesn't, a case wouldn't come to us saying, I, this was algorithmic discrimination. 
it's discrimination based upon one of those protected categories. And then you have to then look to see if it, that occurred from uh, a human or, or because of a uh, discriminatory algorithm. So it's a very tough que answer, uh, question to answer in the sense that we just don't know because of the lack of awareness. And as laws change, we may see an increase of these types of uh, cases. Obviously, I'm seeing a few questions here. Thank you for that. I'm seeing a few. I'm sorry for the provocative question. Um, uh, I'm seeing a few questions here related to just some information around the New York City bias audit. And rather than getting into the details here, we could send a follow up email to everyone who attended and update you all on on actually the um, you know what the law is and what you need to do to prepare. So um, that'll answer a few of these. Um, there was a question here um, that I thought was interesting i don't know um these are agencies i've never heard of so i don't know if it's like outside of um <laughs> your comfort zone keith but there was a question here uh, do you think the international standard should be applied similar to that um the iaea has over the use of nuclear energy and materials to be applied to the wider ai industry so i don't yeah, know if there's it's international standards when it comes to the nuclear um and i don't know that uh I'm just a, a lawyer. I can't even deal with math, let alone nuclear uh, mm -hmm. physicist standards. But look, I mean, it's just the question is, should there should be a should there be a global standard um, related to AI like we see in other areas? And you, you get a lot of questions about that. Um, you know, in the EU, it's they have to get all their member countries to to, to pass something. And and uh, Adriana over there in the United Kingdom, they're not part of that anymore. So it's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, how, how do you make a global standard? You have groups out there like UNESCO or OECD have put out best practices. And in my new paper, I cite to a lot of those. Um, uh, and United Nations too is doing uh, work with their 195 member companies. But how do you get everyone to agree to a worldwide standard um, when you have certain countries that um, just won't for a competitive advantage for whatever reason? Um, and you have some countries uh, that will. So I think getting to a standard in AI like that is going to be um, difficult, um, but certainly there's best practices out there and there's a global standards that apply. Because look, because AI in HR technology, whether it's developed here in the United States, the UK, uh, Europe, or uh, anywhere else, it's gonna be, you know, for global employers, it's gonna, the same technology is gonna be used on all different yeah. continents that they operate on. So um, I think that's where people would like to see some sort of global standard. There is a question there, Keith, around, um, which I feel like is, is not a question about procurement in, in per se. I think it's a question more about who is responsible to make sure that the due diligence process is, is done in a, in a good manner. And it feels sometimes that there's this sort of um, uh, pushing over your responsibility. So sometimes, well, maybe it's the employment lawyers in the company, maybe it could be the procurement, but who, um, how, how do you, what's your recommendation or advice on that? You know, in, in many ways, sorry, Jonathan. I'm just gonna add a few questions around that that kind of round out the idea because I'm reading some of these. So I think uh, around that is also, you know, so people are trying to understand, you know, who's ultimately responsible. Is it the vendor? Is it the, uh, company is it the um you know it, it let's assume it's the company the, the next question is you know around that is hey if we built this really thoughtful risk mitigation process with you know is that something that will be considered if we you know get in trouble yeah there's no definite answer to that because you know the law is the law and we don't allow discrimination but let me tell you are you going to be in a better position you know if there is an investigation if there is a lawsuit or or class action lawsuit, whether it's through us or others, if, if you've taken a lot of due diligence in advance. Uh, you know, we have a lot of employers in the United States that we have jurisdiction over uh, for all the different matters you heard. And, you know, if we have two investigate, this is my own opinion, if we have two investigations and one has done audits, has handbooks, policies, procedures, practices, is doing everything they can in advance to make sure the tools don't discriminate. And look, some discrimination is inevitable, right? I mean, um, no matter how hard you try, whether it's intentionally or not, things happen versus a company that just took the, um, the, the program, implemented it like they do other software and just let it go. I mean, who's going to be in a better position and who's going to have a, a, you know, a better, uh, I don't want to say a defense, but a better story to tell of saying you shouldn't be using our resources here because we really tried and here's everything we did 
versus this company who said, I don't yeah. know, we just bought the program and it was supposed to make hiring better and with no implementation. So uh, like any other area of doing uh, employment audits, you're just going to be in a better position than those who don't. And I think there's, there, there's a lot to that. There's another question here around, um, the, someone said many to, of these AI tools rely on companies to define the criteria for them. And the question is really around, is the EEOC going after the companies also, the technology companies for their tool creating the bias? Or do you guys only go after the, the, the companies that use the technology to ultimately hire somebody um, you yeah, know, or yes. violate the law by hiring somebody? You know, this is, in my opinion, and just, just me as an uh, individual commissioner, I'm not binding the agency to any practices that, that you know, when we do an investigation or a lawsuit, you know, we have jurisdiction over employers, unions, and staffing agencies, you know, and that's it. And ultimately, the employer is liable for the decision they make um, for their employees or potential applicants, and, and no one else. So um, at the end of the day, we're, you know, we're coming, we're showing up at, at the employer. Now we have jurisdiction over the vendors as employers themselves, because a lot of them are large companies to begin with. So if they're using tools to discriminate, it's no different than um, another company, but no, I mean, the investigations are going to, you know, should come in saying, you know, I applied for this company. I didn't get it, this job, or I was fired from this job or wasn't promoted from this job. And then the company's the one that made the decision and whether it's made by an algorithmic tool or whether it's made by a human manager, I, I think for, um, for our purposes for investigation, um, that shouldn't matter because the, the employer makes the employment decision. Now, there's other people who would like to expand that theory. And I think those are novel theories. Um, they haven't been tested. Um, but you know, when you see new technology, you see um, lawyers filing new claims that are novel to try to potentially create law. And that would just have to play out in the courts. And I, one thing I'll add, and um, Adriana, I'll give it right back to you. Um, you know, I, what we're seeing, and Adriana, you could probably um, even say more around this, is that the vendors are going to go through these audits, um, you know, to stay compliant and make sure that they're sharing that their AI is not biased, and the organizations that use these technologies are going to go through these audits. So, um, you know, we're, we're seeing both sides of the marketplace, um, you know, find a need to, to leverage, you know, companies like Holistic to, to um, make sure your, your AI is responsible. Yeah, and I, th I think it's gonna be a, a growing uh, phenomenon. That's why I was actually gonna uh, ask the final question to Keith regarding that, which is the future. Uh, it's very difficult to do any forecasting, Keith, that's for sure. But how do you see the, you know, the state of play for the next two years? If I don't want to do 10 years, but the next two years, I think this, half of the decade feels like there's going to be loads and loads of events uh, that would take place. But how do you see it going forward uh, in your view? Well, well th th this time uh, earlier this, I mean, earlier this year or this time last year, nobody could predict it that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, AI would be the front page of every news and everyone's uh, parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles would be talking about it because of uh, uh, chat GPT opposed to the people who are in the uh, industry. So it's tough. So all, I mean, like I said, what's not changing is Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act. What's not changing is the EEOC's enforcement authority or the requirement that employers make decisions in hiring that don't discriminate. And so I can answer that question saying from our perspective, it just doesn't matter. You know, that's just not relevant. Well, what's relevant is, are you complying um, with the laws, no matter what tools you're doing? And what are you doing in advance to prevent discrimination? And look, most companies the vast majority of companies have employment handbooks, have open door policies, prohibit sexual, um, you know, any kind of sexual harassment or uh, discrimination. So I think the same just needs to be happening here with the AI tools, just clear and thoughtful use of the tools and company policy that, you know, these tools are only gonna be used for the right purpose and anyone not using them for the right purpose, uh, there'll be consequences for because ultimately, you know, the liability for there. So I think it's gonna be more of a, of a governance issue of now, just like any other major technology that has come online for corporations, like email, like the internet, like cell phones, texting. It's just, you know, you make policies and procedures around that and you work around those uh, confines. So that's where I, I think it has to go um, for this to continue. Yeah, very, very good. I mean, I think I should just uh, yeah, wrap it up for the day. Um, very conscious of time, and uh, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, uh, your, your address and uh, 
and the thoughtful answer to the questions, Keith. Really My appreciate pleasure. that. I hope it was not the last time we have this encounter. We have opportunity to also do it in person, but I'll let Jonathan make any, any final comments. No, I just want to say thank you. Really looking forward to uh, learning more and, and, and watching this space evolve. So excited nice. to, uh, to keep the conversation going. And, you know, and thank to everyone watching um, and all that you all are doing to make sure that these tools uh, are complying with our longstanding laws, because from our perspective, that's all we can ask for. Yeah, no, uh, uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you very much, Keith, for coming and uh, Jonathan for co-moderating. Thank, thank you. you. Take Good care, day. everybody. Cheers. Bye.